Uh, welcome to the, the one of the skeptics talks for for Balticon this year. Um, so the last couple of years, well, first of all, I'm Dr. Tom Holtz. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist at the University of Maryland, and I've been doing some of the skepticism panels for Balticon since almost since we started doing those. Uh, yay! And um, so you know, in the past, I've done various sorts of things, including sort of general principles and. Uh, and an overview of, of in big topics and so forth. And so I'll try to figure out what's something specific I could do that's do, new and different here. And so what I'm gonna talk about actually really ties in to science fiction conventions, and that's the relationship between popular science fiction and claims of the paranormal. So this isn't gonna be one of those talks all about how science ruins everything. Um, as such, um, and it really isn't going to be so much about how human perception uh, and critical thinking skills aren't always what they should be. These actually are a series of pictures that came from a, uh, um, an ad campaign for lens cleaners. <laughs> and it really, there's actually three of them in a row, but it really gets the point across here that we all misperceive things. Um, and for various reasons, you know, are, you know, for example, if anyone claims there are no UFOs, they're lying. Absolutely, there are UFOs because we see things in the sky and we as individuals don't necessarily know what they are. By definition, those are unidentified flying objects. <laughs> the problem is the conflation of the term UFO for alien starship. Not the same words, not the same phrases. They're totally different things. So, you know, unless you clearly see what it is, you might miss that it's a hat, or, you know, you might miss that it's a log in, in a lock, or, uh, or you might miss the fact that you're getting hoaxed. Um, so there's the zipper. <laughs> so I'm not gonna talk so much about the perception issue as such, but instead about some of the modifiers of perception that are out there, some of the filters, and filters that come from popular science fiction. Um, and because some classic cases of claims of the paranormal are definitely informed by and inspired by, uh, by at the time, recent science fiction stories. So I'll talk about some of the big famous ones, certain, certain aspects of the claims of the Loch Ness Monster, of uh, one of the most famous cases of, of US, UFO abduction or alien abduction, uh, as well as the chupacabra, uh, which absolutely is tied into a popular science uh, thing. Because I'll, I'll say this, the chupacabra did not exist for the first decade I was going to Balticon. <laughs> the chupacabra's first report was 1995. It is not a traditional story. It is a modern story. Um, and then I'll finish with something that is not well known today, but sort of a classic case of claims of the paranormal that didn't really take off in the public directly, but is absolutely tied into print science fiction, in fact, very much pulp science fiction, and that'll be the Shaver Mysteries. So, first I'll start with the Loch Ness Monster. And by the way, here's a picture almost none of you have ever seen, the uncropped version of the surgeon's photo, where it becomes a lot more apparent that is not a large object. You know, when they focus in on it a lot smaller, a lot closer, it looks blurrier, and our mind can tell us it's whatever size we want it to be. But when you see it uncropped, the fact that it's a toy becomes a lot more apparent. And for those of you who haven't heard, yeah, back in the, the 90s, it came out, the confession of the people who did it. It's a hoax. So this e even, that doesn't, and again, critical thinking skills. If this is a hoax, that doesn't mean there is no Loch Ness Monster. You could independently have someone who does a hoax photograph and there still be a Loch Ness Monster. So don't, just because something has a hoax in it doesn't mean it's unreal, but we still have to judge things on the evidence for itself. Um, and so here we have the first major report of Nessie. Um, and from 1933, and at this point, it's almost just a big animal in the water, big object in the water story. And let's face it, every lake in every country of the world has stories about something big in the water. Normally, 
normally with the addition of it, I had it on my line and, um, <laughs> but um, so we have uh, someone, uh, a wife of a well-known well businessman and, um, and the business himself were motoring along the side of the lock and they saw a tremendous upheaval on what was a uh, calm water. Uh, and they noticed about three quarters mile from the storm, and what they saw was something rolling and plunging in the water. They saw some of these lumps on it and that, so very indistinct, just lumps rolling in the water, and then it goes away, and they waited for a while and didn't see it again. So nothing in this description that informs us anything about the nature of the creature, if it is indeed a creature. So. Just someone saw something in the lake, and it's unusual. So this is April 1933. But it's there in the, uh, in, in this case, the Inverness Courier. So it's out there. It's in the press. People are talking about it. Until we get a description of an actual creature with, with attributes. This came out in July of 33, so a couple months later. And uh, uh, two Londoners who were visiting the lock because just recently a major highway had been put in from um, Edinburgh and points further south up to Inverness, and they were getting a lot more tourism there. Uh, so some lenders were visiting, and they saw it's the nearest approach to a dragon or a prehistoric animal that I have ever seen in life. It crossed my road about 50 yards ahead and appeared to be carrying a small lamb or animal of some kind. It seemed to have a long neck which moved up and down in the manner of a scenic railroad, and its body was fairly big with a high back. Now, the later reports from starting in July 33 onward have an attribute of the Loch Ness Monster which is not part of the common story. The Loch Ness Monster is a land animal. <laughs> the Loch Ness Monster in the 1930s, for the next series of reports, is a land animal, <laughs> not a water animal. So people have sort of conflated all these reports to talking about a marine creature. So here's another description <laughs> of the Loch Ness Monster. A long-necked creature that's gray walking around. A series of people reporting, you know, um, and in fact, even in, in 1934, no month reported, a girl, good reporting there, reports a gigantic creature with a small hand, head at the end of a long neck. So in the summer of 1933 into 1934, there were lots of reports and claims of people seeing something indistinct in the distance, which clearly was a big, animal with a big back and a long neck and a neck that's doing this as it goes by, sometimes carrying struggling things in its mouth, walking across. Now it's notable that back in April of 1933, something happened in the UK and that was the premiere of King Kong, <laughs> which of course has some classic scenes in it, featuring a large, indistinct, presumably gray, but of course everything's gray in that movie, animal in this case a sauropod, with a neck that does this as it's animated walking around, occasionally carrying a struggling, in this case, human being in its jaws. Um, well, in fact, you don't get to see its feet clearly, and in fact, all these descriptions typically say we couldn't see the feet clearly, because it's you know, behind there. The reason, of course, being that it was easier to animate if you didn't have to see all the detail of the feet. Um, and of course, it doesn't just stay on land. In, in King Kong, it does swim around with sort of these classic postures in the water. So it may be that people were seeing something, whether that doesn't necessarily mean that the thing that they, that they were, the thing that they were seeing actually existed, but it could well be that people were seeing something and in the filter of their mind, they're seeing, their, their mind says, ah, here's something that it reminds me of in the back of my mind, something I've just seen in the movies. Um, so sort of the classic example of that, the extreme example of that, was back uh, in when Reagan was president and he claimed certain rem memories he had from World War II that people went back and said, no, those are actually scripts from movies he was in. <laughs> and, you know, I don't, and most people don't think he was necessarily lying, it's just that he was confused. And, and people can be confused to varying degrees. Um, but another even... Uh, more, more specific one, one we could tie into even more details, is the classic UFO abduction story, the, the uh, Betty and Barney Hill abduction story of the night of 19, uh, of 19 to 20 of September of 61. Uh, this is the one that sort of normalized and codified alien abductions. 
there had been claims of being abducted by flying saucer people before that, in the 50s and so forth. And they tended to be very different, like they were being abducted by blonde people from Venus. That was actually a common, common, common attribute of the abductions of the 1950s. Blonde people from Venus. Um, and then we get this event. So here's uh, Betty and Barney Hill, um, who were uh, driving around in New Hampshire. Uh, they claimed to see a UFO with windows and figures inside the windows. Um, they actually reported it to the U.S. Air Force the next day, and, and, and they got questioned by the uh, USAF following that, uh, because the Air Force was investigating such issues at the time. In their initial descriptions to the Air Force, they didn't say anything beyond having seen an object flying in the sky and figures in the windows. About 10 days later, um, Betty uh, Hill started having troubling dreams where she remembered being taken up uh, into the sh spaceship. And they were concerned about the, ta the fact that as they reconstructed their sequence of time it took them to get home, uh, they seemed to be missing time. Normally they would have been able to do that drive in about four hours, and it took them seven hours that night. Um, and so they were worried about this enough that when they found out about, uh, about hypnotic therapy and hypnotic recall of memories, they decided to, to go ahead and have that done. So that was in uh, the late winter into the early summer of 1964 where they did these hypnotic therapies with uh, uh, a, a psychiatrist to try to remember more of the details. And so they found in, under hypnosis that there were a lot more details beyond there being figures there. This is sort of the classic, they were brought on board, they don't actually remember entering the vehicle, they remember seeing the vehicle land and the figures in front of them and then they're inside and were separately being probed and prodded and so forth, um, having you know, things probing in places that shouldn't be probed, uh, at least not by medical professionals. Um, and uh, uh, the star map that, that, uh, that Betty Hill remembers seeing on there and conversations with them and, and, and Barney Hill remembering how the eyes of the aliens would communicate with them, that it was like telepathy through the eyes and so forth. And these wrap around, uh, well, at least that's what Barney said. Uh, so this became sort of the classic alien abduction phenomenon that, that people, from that, it sort of normalized what alien abduction phenomena was like. But of course, being a, a kidnapped by alien figures and brought on board ships and probed and so forth was absolutely nothing new in fiction. And it goes way back to the early days of the pulps, if not before. I mean, and there are precursors in culture well before them of fairies taking you underneath their hills and so forth. Um, and, and incubus and succubi and so forth, coming to you, night hags coming to you in the middle of the night. What's really intriguing is when some investigators went back and saw what was on TV during the time that the hills were undergoing this hypnotic therapy. And they found the episodes of Outer Limits that were, that were being aired at the time that this hypnotherapy happened. Here are the ones, so they begin in January of 64, of continue through, through June. And so here are the three ones in the middle of February of that year. So the first one uh, was a story called The Invisibles that involves aliens using surgical procedures to imp put implants in people, as they remembered happening. Uh, the following week, the Bolero Shield, aliens with these wraparound eyes that in fact they sort of communicate with everything with eyes, can, can understand each other, I think is a line from it. And then finally, the Children of Spider uh, Country, which also have aliens with these big wraparound looking eyes that abduct humans in rural locations. And so here is the alien that Barney drew, or uh, so he sketched what the abductors looked like. And here are the aliens from two of those episodes. Um, so it may well be that in the hypnotic state, he wasn't actually recalling, he wasn't trying to lie or anything, but he was adding in imagery that he had perceived elsewhere. And what's notable and what you never see in the reconstruction of the aliens is that is not the alien his wife saw. His wife did not see this alien. 
Betty Hill specifically stated that the aliens had hair and Jimmy Durante noses. You don't see that among the UFO fans anymore. They don't talk about the fact that they were abducted, apparently, by two different types of aliens. Um, because this became fixed in people's image, that this is what the aliens are supposed to look like. Um, well, and even more so, when this story got told on, on TV um, as a, a made-for-TV movie on, on NBC, and I will tell you, this scared the bejeebers out of me. I was terrified when I saw this. Uh, it's one of, the, one of a handful of, of things that I had seen in the movies or TV that had me totally sleepless that night. There's this, and there was the, the 1970s version of um, Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Those two nights, I did not get any sleep. Oh, and also, well, the first time I saw a documentary about ghosts being real. So the first time I saw adults talking about ghosts not just being folklore or on Scooby-Doo, but people treating them as real, I got really scared that night. So um, by today's standards, even by the outer limits standards, actually, the special effects aren't really good. But at this point, they, they, they portrayed it as a single coherent story, which it isn't in the two hypnotherapies. Um, but it did sort of gel together to form a good single story. And since then, that's pretty much the only alien that's abducted people. Mm -hmm. There's a handful of other alien races that have abducted people, which is kind of a shame, because when we go back to earlier points in UFO abductions, there were all sorts of different aliens. There were like giant, sort of giant floating Jawas. Uh, there were, there's the Mothman, didn't abduct people. There are dwarves, you know, with giant beards. So the aliens of Erebor, um, you know. insectoids, you know, here's one that's called a reptilian, although it looks kind of like the Michelin man. Um, there's a Horda, and 71, so maybe it is a Horda, I don't know. Um, there's a Dalek, 1957 is a Dalek. You know, I, Daleks abducting people, I don't have a problem with the fact that people, they let them go is kind of suspicious. Um, so, yeah, but since, especially, well, first of all, since that, that made-for-TV movie, and really then another wave with um, Strieber's books about abductions, that sort of eliminated the rest of the alien races, the great purge of other aliens that were out there. Because it basically normalized in our pop culture what the aliens who abduct us are supposed to look like. The old days, all sorts of races were around. There were federations of, keep, of peoples coming here to probe us. And now it's just the grays. I mean, maybe everyone else got all the information they needed. You know, I don't know what more they need to probe there. But uh, after a while, it got to the point where all you have to do is draw the oval with a point on the bottom and two wraparound figures, and anyone in the world will recognize that is what an alien looks like. Now, to us, to science fiction fans, that's ridiculous. But nevertheless, to gen the general public, that is what aliens look like. In fact, they might not even think that alien means an inhabitant of a creature from another world. To them, alien is people who go around in flying saucers butt probing. Yeah. <laughs> There's a book, uh, The Day After Roswell, a nonfiction book, written by Lieutenant Corso. And it posits in that book that uh, the government, after the Roswell crash, had seen what the aliens looked like. They looked like the greys. And so they actually leaked that image and made sure that everyone you know, knows that these are what the aliens look like, so that if they ever should land and come out of their ship, we would be acclimated to it. <laughs> Before we start shooting. Yeah, well, well you know, you, 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 can, you, can, you can say all you want about that. They can write all they want, but we know what happened at Roswell. I, I, I don't have those slides here, but we know what happened at Roswell because it's all been declassified, because it was a proto, it was a, an attempt to be able to sound out if the Soviets were blowing up A-bombs. And the wreckage at Roswell very clearly is 100% definitely, because there are photographs of it if you go back, the balloons and their targets that were designed for that investigation. And the fact that the government for a short time said, no, no, it was a crashed flying saucer, and then someone knocked the guy over the head and said, that's stupid. No, no, it was a weather balloon. So there was a cover-up, but the cover-up wasn't that it was an alien Flying saucer, the flying saucer aspect of it was part of the cover-up. It was actually 
Uh, if I have more time, I'll talk about it. We know what happened at Roswell. There were no bodies. It was just the, the US government trying to cover up the fact we were trying to figure out if the Soviets were blowing up A-bombs. Um, yeah, that's what they wanted us to think, which is why the, the alien craft spaceship is actually made of tin foil and uh, dowels and, uh, and tape you could buy at a craft store. So um, the Chupacabra. So, you know, I remember the early days of the internet. Suddenly you start hearing about the Chupacabra. And, you know, I go back to thinking, and I was thinking at the time, I had all those books about unexplained monsters from around the world. You know, I checked the Heuvelman's books out of the library when I was in high school and so forth. This creature's not in there at all. This is not a traditional cryptid. And then all of a sudden people are talking about it, specifically coming out of, of Puerto Rico, the first eyewitness report in 1995. Uh, chupacabra means goat sucker. I mean, there are goat suckers. Those are a type of bird, and that's what we're talking. We're not talking about those here. And here's the, the description of it. It's this weird, semi-humanoid creature with claws and spikes coming out of its back, um, and invoked, seen to be prowling around, and used to explain the fact that every so often people find dead bodies of animals out there, and people don't know how to handle finding dead bodies in the wild. So they're drained of their blood, which they aren't. The blood settles to one side, or it does drain out into the soil and so forth. Um, ordinary, people are not used to looking at decayed organisms or, or dead organisms. It's like any time an animal washes up on shore and its skin has come off. Oh, it's the Montauk monster. No, it's just a raccoon. That's what raccoons look like when their fur isn't on them anymore. Um, so the chupacabra. Uh, and people started to, to then report about it afterwards, and in, in Latin America, that's what the chupacabra looks like. Now, there is a secondary incarnation of the chupacabra, the U.S. version, which is a dog with mange. And every so often, a dog with mange or a coyote with mange will get photographed, and people say, look, it's a chupacabra. But this is what the chupacabra looks like in its traditional, original 1990s incarnation. And notice it is... Uh, August of 95, and what opened in July of 95 was Species. And include, it, was, it did open in Puerto Rico at the time. And before, before the alien in that looks like that, it looks like this. And in fact, you know, with the spikes coming out of its back and off its head and its predatory mode, and in fact, the, the woman who, was, who investigated it had seen the movie. Uh, the first one who reported had seen species. They went and actually did the, the thing. They actually asked her, have you seen species? Yes, I saw species. Um, so there actually was, a, and I'll have the reference towards it at the end, of a specific investigation where a folklorist decided, this is a relatively new story. Let's see if we can trace the history of the chupacabra. And so this is actually a really well-documented history to have someone doing this early on in the history of that. There are some good reviews of Roswell, but of course that's many decades later. Uh, on the other hand, that means there's a much richer story behind it because all so many new incarnations of the story came out. Um, now, I mentioned that those were all sort of big ones. They made big splashes in culture. Um, here's one that didn't, at least not directly, but is far more tied into, um, into science fiction in the pulp form. And this is, uh, this will, well, this will be the shaver mystery. Now, in pulp science fiction, you know, saucer-shaped ships are nothing new. You know, aliens trying to attack the Earth, nothing new. Um, I showed this figure before, you know, people, pro uh, aliens probing people, nothing new there. Uh, but something that was kind of new was the claims that these were actually real. So, uh, the so-called shaver mystery was a, a phenomenon in the mid 40s in pulp science fiction. And it was letters from this guy, uh, there it is, Richard Shaver, um, two amazing stories. And here's Ray Palmer, who was the uh, uh, publisher of Amazing Stories. So it was in the, in the mid 1940s, and Shaver claiming that on missions in the Pacific uh, during the war, which of course is still going on, that he had found passageways in islands in the South Pacific that went into the the hollow earth. So he'd go down, gone down into the hollow earth and fought with these little gray creatures. Now they're not aliens because they're from earth. They were called the Deros, which stands for detrimental robot. Um, 
who are engaged in a war against the Taros, which were these blonde people. Um, and the, the Daros had ray guns, and they flew around in saucer-shaped airships and so forth. And the Daros' mission was to mind control people around the world. And they had all sorts of things. They would put implants in people. They would abduct people. They would have mind control rays. Uh, they were, of course, behind the fascists and so forth. Um, and so what happened is Palmer started publishing these letters he was getting in. Uh, as some of them claimed to be the actual accounts of this guy, and other ones uh, were stories based in this setting. And then other people would write in letters, oh yeah, I was abducted by the Darrows too. Um, and the circulation went really well, and this was a really popular topic. So yeah, Shaver started publishing stories. So here's one, the Shaver mystery, and this one, at this one, it's told as if it's the true story. But then later on, there's I Remember Lemuria, so a, 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 a fictional story in that setting, and another one, The Mind Rovers by Richard Shaver and so forth. Uh, now, not everyone, not all fans were happy with it. So here we have a, a quote by J.A. Keel. Amazing stories is still trying to convince everyone that the bug-eyed monsters in caves run the world, and I was blaming it on the Democrats. <laughs> so, uh, so, so we have within the context of science fiction fandom, and not even like the big world, but science fiction fandom claims from one person, suddenly other people are coming in. And yeah, I'm sure most of them are trolling. Um, but you never know. Some people might then start saying, well, that's something weird happened to me. Maybe it was the Darrows or something. Um, now, there's an interesting uh, thing that happened after that, and that is Ray Palmer then started a new magazine called Fate Magazine. And he wanted it specifically to be a venue for the Shaver mystery and related claims of unusual phenomenon so that amazing stories could, function, could focus more on just on fiction. And he had a really good story for the first issue. And that was the reports of a guy called Kenneth Arnold about seeing discs skipping like flying saucers in the American Northwest that he had seen back in, in, in 47. That's the, the coining of the term. This is, this is the actual article that coins the term flying saucers. Um, and uh, so fate then began to be the, the first major focus for the sort of claims that we call claims of the paranormal, uh, at least for the 1940s. And then, of course, lots of other uh, magazines came off. Some were slicker ones, some were even cheaper than this, and so forth. <laughs> so, um, so science fiction and popular science fiction at that is really tied into a lot of these early claims. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so uh, that was just, I wanted to go through a bunch of, of basics of, of, of how, how, yeah, I know this would be great, uh, of how different ideas from science fiction can make their way into the public consciousness and then get normalized to the point where we don't even think about it anymore that, you know, oh yeah, um, of course the Loch Ness Monster is a long-necked creature that lives in the loch, when all the previous accounts of seeing something weird in the lake are just some lumps. Or that aliens who come to Earth come down, have wraparound eyes, and are bald and butt probe, and so forth. Um, and just a couple of the references here. So here, I've got my copy of it here. Um, Abominable Science uh, by Loxton and Prothero, uh, which actually is a good job of looking into the early stories of the, the, basically the origins of most of the famous cryptids, that is the creatures that, the unknown creatures that we see in, uh, in the cryptozoological circles. And they actually went back and researched the first reports of it, rather than the later tales about it. And you'll see how things shift, like the Yeti, very clearly. All the early references to it are a bear. Absolutely, unquestionably, they're talking about the local bear. Um, and then it gets normalized into being a giant upright primate. Um, and it's kind of cool to see. And that's not to say that the folklore isn't fun, because the folklore is fun. Uh, and then this, the, here's the tracking of the chupacabra by Radford, where he was able to go back and, and look at that history because it's so recent and it's at a time when we have so much documentation that you can actually see how, how a report makes its way into popular culture. Uh, and one I didn't put up there, but I brought with me, a very different approach, is Conway, uh, Cosman, and Nash. 
Uh, the Cryptozoologicon, because you can clearly read that saying, crypto, okay, the Cryptozoologicon, um, it's a Conway and, and Nish are paleontologists and, and Coastman is an artist, and they decided to take various cryptids and reconstruct them as if they were real animals, not just as their shapes, but their evolutionary history. <laughs> um, and instead of doing the cliches that a lot of people do, like making Nessie a plesiosaurus, which doesn't make much sense for where it is and when it is, coming up with reasonable explanations, but interesting explanations for what these animals would be. Now, they're not claiming that these things are real. In fact, they're specifically claiming, no, the evidence is that these things aren't real. But to give them some sort of intriguing, new, um, but evolutionarily reasonable explanation. This is volume one, and they apparently are working on volume two. Uh, and I, since we've got a little time here, I, I could talk a little bit about Roswell, the story of Roswell. So, uh, uh, so here's the claim everyone knows. So the aliens crash in July of 47. Here it is. Here's the photo. That's the alien wreckage. That was the published photograph that came out. It, where, the bodies weren't reported at first. The bodies, and that's the cool thing. If you look at the, and then when the people have investigated the history of Roswell, the early, the 1940s don't talk about reports of the bodies. The bo reports of the bodies come in later in the folklore. So then the U.S. Air Force, oh, Army Air, Air Corps, I should say, ru uh, rushes in to collect the debris and the dead alien bodies and is taken to Roswell Army Airfield for study. And then, and this is absolutely true. You can find the records. In July, uh, July 8, the U.S says that they have captured a flying saucer. Flying saucer is just being reported earlier that summer in Fate magazine. And here, here it is. Uh, RAAF captures flying saucer on ranch in Roswell region. Um, and then the next day, the statement is immediately retracted. and says, no, no, it was just a weather balloon. And those are, two, those are facts. Those last two are facts. You can go and check them up. So here's the story. In November of 46, NYU receives a, con a contract to build constant level balloons for surveillance of the Soviets. So remember, this is long before satellites are up there. This is before the U-2 has been built. Um, how do we know what's going on over in the Soviet Union? We know or strongly suspect that they are planning on building A-bombs. So people had observed, a physicist had observed, that there are horizons in the atmosphere where sound might travel very effectively around the world. So if you could have long-term monitoring of those and then retrieve that information, we could hear booms from the other side of the planet. Um, but of course, first you have to do is develop constant level balloons, which didn't exist yet. So the, the tests were done in the spring and summer of 47 at Alamoguardo, New Mexico. And the, the original tests were have balloons with radar targets hanging below them, suspended from these multi-balloon lifts. And there's a photograph, well, that's rather a drawing of the setup of these lifts and the targets. There's the target. And consider what the picture of the crashed Roswell remains look like. looks like. There it is. There's your alien flying saucer. It's a mylar and dowels and string. Um, and then what happened in 47? One of these balloons did break free. It was discovered by ranchers in mid-June, June 24. Ken Arnold reports in Fate Magazine, the flying saucers. Uh, July 4th, the ranchers go back to this record and say, hey, maybe this is one of them there flying saucers. <laughs> Report it to the local uh, authorities, and then the government goes, crap, and sends people out there to collect it, and they say, no, yeah, yeah that was one of those flying saucers. That was what it was. And then you know, whoever higher up said, you moron, that's only going to get attention. So, oh, no, 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 it was a weather balloon. So, um, um, yeah, so there, and there it is again. So here is the test object from NYU, and there is the crashed flying saucer. Yeah, there we go, yeah. It, only no human technology could produce that. Um, and actually, Roswell kind of faded from popular culture, from, from UFO circles for a while. It wasn't one of the key incidents until 1980 when Berlitz and Moore came out with the Roswell incident, still in print, I believe. Certainly you could still get it. And of course, Berlitz is famous for, for popularizing and or promoting many claims to the paranormal. He invented the Philadelphia experiment. He invented the Bermuda Triangle. He gave it its name. And he sort of modernized, if that's the appropriate term, stories of Atlantis before stories of Atlantis go way, way back. So he by no means invented it. What I'm wondering is how sort of 
because anyone can see, like, there's a lot of reports of unidentified things, but for something to really stick, it has to be resonant. Yeah. And so I'm wondering how Loch Ness and Bigfoot play to existing fears and tensions to become a hit, to yeah. become something that became. Well, there's there's an issue with Loch Ness I'll get to, and it's it's a pound sign. Um, <laughs> But before we get there, the, uh, an interesting thing that ties in there is that the, the flying objects with interesting inhabitants that people saw in the late 19th century in the U.S. were not aliens. It was the great airship flaps. And in those cases, the pilots of them were intrepid Yankee or whatever inventors who were testing out their new machines and were landing in the middle of nowhere and had conversations with people. And in that case, it's not fear so much, it's, it's the, uh, the joy of progress rather than the fear of technology overrunning us. So maybe a late 19th rather than early into mid 20th century view on it. Um, yeah. You see a similar progression in, in Japan as well. In mm. the late 19th century, robots are seen as this great innovation thing that people are going to start doing. In the early 20th, they become this scary thing. Mm. But as for, as for Loch Ness, for, you know, like I said, people, have, people see creatures in every lake. There's no lake that doesn't have some legends about it, whether it's just the big sturgeon that gets away mm -hmm. or whatever. It, that, that's, you know, there are fish stories everywhere. Um, I did mention that in 33, uh, the, the reason that those Londoners were visiting is that the big highway had come through. Um, and it is absolutely known that whether or not the initial reports, the initial reports were probably honest, honest views, but there were townspeople who actively hoaxed, like putting footprints around <laughs> the lake and then bringing people in, investigators or hunters in from London to see that. But, yeah, exactly. That was the elephant, elephant the hippo foot umbrella stand. Exactly, um, because come see the creature at the lake is a good incentive to get people from London and London and Edinburgh to go all the way up to Inverness, uh, which is you know halfway to the Arctic Circle. Okay, not, not that bad, but yeah, uh, yeah. So, um, so sure, exactly. So even by the '30s, you know, having an attraction for if it's inspired for whatever reason promoting the, the act of promoting of the attraction is maybe. so yeah and, and so in a sense that may well be simply getting the money into the local economy uh from places in the country that didn't that had more money than than rural scotland as for bigfoot um you know maybe it's a bit of really wanting there to be the wildness left in america when was um, it depends upon how far you want to take it back. The classic Bigfoot is, I think, 50s. Actually, they go into a lot of detail in here. The, the stories of the Sasquatch of legend isn't Bigfoot. The Sasquatch in legend are people. They have teepees or whatever the local huts were. They had tools. They were just the people of the forest. Certainly, there were pro some of the promoters of like the frozen Bigfoot specimens were saying, come see the missing link. That definitely was part of that culture, uh, was to come, come see the missing link we have frozen in the sideshows of, uh, of, you know, wherever it is going around. And let's face it, the, sh the whole, that whole sideshow curiosity thing used to be so, so, so big. It's less so around, but I mean, if, you, if you do travel between... Tucson and points east, you know, come see the thing. What is the thing? Stop by the thing. And it takes a buck to go see the thing. So don't, if you're there, go see the thing. Uh, it is not Ben Grimm, sadly. Um, but, um, you know, actually, I, I had a, a talk for one of my other class, for one of my classes on hoaxes in, in paleontology. And there were classic 19th century hoaxes where people said, you know, a mastodon's cool, but if we throw a bunch of mastodons together, it's cooler. Um, so the, the great Missourium, largest of terrestrial animals, was where they took a complete mastodon skeleton and then added in extra vertebrae from a couple more and then put the, the, the tusks in the wrong position. And he made a lot of money off that. He said, that's cool. We can make sea serpents. So they took early whales and then added in enough vertebrae. So you went from a 70-foot early whale to 114 feet. And he, he, he promoted as Hydrarchos, lord of the ancient seas, the actual skeleton of the, of the sea serpent. And, and traveled around, actually not only the U.S., but Europe, um, 
So, so that whole come in and see it thing, obviously that, that's been an incentive since people had invented money. So, um, Very big in Japan as well. Yeah, oh absolutely, yeah. Well, well uh, in mass media and, uh, and paranormal in Japan, one cool thing was, we, look at this, uh, I'll, have to, I'll have to finish up momentarily. One of the um, weird bits of, of how the mass media affects people's perception in Japan was what, what color are mitochondria? If, no, no what, what, what color are mitochondria? If you ask Japanese kids in the late 1990s, they would tell you, uh, the large majority of them, green. And that's because the game, the, the game and then TV, or the game and then movie, Parasite Eve, oh. specifically shows mitochondria glowing green before they blow people up. Because that, the, the premise of Parasite Eve is that the mitochondria are sick and tired of this whole endosymbiosis bit and they want to fight back. Um, and they glow green. And that became popular enough that people then, uh, 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 educators in Japan started asking kids in Japan, what color are mitochondria? And of course, they're, too, they're really too small to have color. But the, green, absolutely they're green. That was like the only color answer people would give. So, um, you know, the, the popular culture has an influence on our, our public perception of science. So. Built Down Man. Built Down Man, I had actually, that's part of my whole hoax lecture. Um, that one has, we almost certainly know who the hoaxer is. So people talk about all these other potential, it almost certainly is Dawson, uh, the guy who, who brought the fossils to the attention of the British Museum. Uh, because he was actually involved in 33 separate hoaxes beforehand, having to do with antiquities. <laughs> so we don't have to invoke Teilhard de Chardin or Sir Arthur Conan Doyle when we have a known hoaxer tied into the story. Uh, and, yeah, and uh, so he brought in, um, um, it was definitely playing off of public perceptions at the time because Piltdown Man was reconstructed to fit what was the current conception of what early humans were supposed to look like with big brains but not upright, when in fact it turns out it's the opposite. Upright stance was first, then big brains. And it actually gave Great Britain its own important fossil human when the other, they didn't have one yet, whereas the Germans had Neanderthals, the French had Cro-Magnon and so forth. So, uh, so they were finally able to get one. So that's very clearly a hoax. So thank you for coming. and. Uh,